Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll be focusing on that first reading from 2 Samuel chapter 11. Let us pray. Lord God, I pray that you would speak to us through your word, that you would change our hearts, that you would make us strong to face the temptations of the evil one, and that you would give us peace in Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord God, that, that you would speak to your people today and I would not get in the way of that message. In your name we pray, amen. Every day we open up the newspaper and we wonder, who's next? You know, which comedian, which actor, which athlete, which politician, which famous pastor, which priest will be caught up in scandal today? Which person did we used to look up to that's now going to make the front page of the newspaper? Who's going to be the next great person to fall? And then today we, we, we open up the paper and we're shocked what we read. The headline says, King David Caught in Scandal abuses woman and kills her husband. And we can't believe it. We can't believe that this is David. <laughs> David, the one who is the one after God's own heart. David, the one who fought against Goliath. David was the one who had that deep relationship with Jonathan. David, the one who spared Saul's life when he could have killed him. David, the one who wrote all of those prayers in the Bible. David the Great, how could this great man do something so heinous? And the reason that it really strikes us so deep is because we know if a man of great faith like David could fall and do something so wicked and evil, so could I. So could you. Are we any better than David? Are we any stronger than David? Do we know anything more about God than David does? If David could fall, so could we. And so we need to face the fact that, that this is in the scriptures and we have to try to figure out why would this very difficult story about this great man be told in such gory details. And it makes me think of the New Testament where it says, that Paul writes this, he says that all scripture, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So God gave us everything. Everything in the Scripture is breathed by God, came into being because of God, and all of it is useful to teach us, rebuke us, correct us. So, so what is God trying to teach us through this story? How is God trying to to, to rebuke us and correct us and train us so that we would be equipped for every good work, so that we wouldn't go the way that David went. How, how is this to read this headline so that our name will never be in the headlines? And so let's dive right in and see what this story is all about. It happened in springtime, and in springtime was usually when kings go off to battle. But this time, King David, who's become the king of all of Israel, all of Judah, he sends out Joab and Israel's army and all of the king's men. Everybody leaves except for David. He stays back in Jerusalem. And while he stays back in, in Jerusalem, one night he gets up in the middle of the night, he starts walking on the roof of his home and he sees this woman bathing. Now, this woman is probably not giving some kind of peep show. The reason this woman is bathing is probably to follow the ceremonial laws of Moses. And so she's bathing herself, and, and David sees this woman, and she real, he realizes she's very beautiful. And so he asks about her. He sends someone to find out about her. And the messenger comes back and says, David, you know who this is? This is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam. And she is the wife of... She is the wife to Uriah the Hittite. The Hittite means that, you know this man, he was converted to, to Judaism. And Uriah, you know Uriah, he's one of your mighty soldiers. You know who this is and that's his wife. But David sends for her. 
And the Hebrew here is very graphic. It says he took her. He slept with her. And it says then she went on to, to clean herself of her uncleanliness. And, and she, she cleaned herself. I, I think this is what happens very often in a, in a case like this where, where she feels the shame of something that wasn't her own fault. It wasn't her own fault and yet she, she washes herself to somehow get rid of the shame that sticks to her. And then she goes home. She sends a message back to David and says, I'm pregnant. And then David sends a message to Uriah to bring him back from battle. When Uriah comes back from battle, David goes out to greet him and says, how are the soldiers? How's the army? How's the battle going? You've come on a long trip. Maybe you should go home and, and wash your feet and sleep in your own bed. And Uriah leaves and a care package was sent to him. But he never makes it home. He sleeps outside the king's palace. Later on, he finds out that, that Uriah slept outside and so, so David goes up to Uriah and says, hey, haven't you come on a long military campaign? Why don't you go home and, and see your wife? He says, I couldn't do that. The ark of God and Joab and all the king's people, they're out fighting a battle and they're staying in tents. How could I go home and sleep with my wife and be in my own home? I would never do something like that. And so David said, okay, you stay one more night. And David invites him over and feeds him and then gives him something to drink. And David keeps putting drinks in front of Uriah until Uriah is drunk. But even a drunk Uriah is more noble than a sober David. And he sleeps outside his palace again. So the next morning, David wakes up and he begins to draft a letter. And the letter says something like this, put Uriah at the front lines and when the fighting is fiercest, withdraw so that he will be struck down. David folds up that letter and gives it to Uriah. And Uriah is so noble, he will not open up his own assassination letter. Job receives the letter, puts Uriah in the front lines. Uriah is killed. The message gets back to David. Bathsheba mourns over the loss of her husband and David brings Bathsheba into his home to be his wife. And most of Israel is probably thinking, what a noble king! He, he's taking care of this poor woman who just lost her husband, but the scriptures cut through all of that and the story ends like this. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. What are we supposed to make of this? What are we supposed to do when we see a story like this, when somebody so noble, so good, someone that up until this point in our sermon series, we have been trying to follow his example. What are we supposed to do when we see someone so good take such a great fall? Well, Paul tells us how we're supposed to understand these kinds of things. He says in the New Testament, now these things occurred. The things in the Old Testament, when you read the Old Testament, that's why you should read the Old Testament. When we read these stories in the Old Testament, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. God gave us the scriptures to warn us that we would not set our hearts on those things that are evil, that we would not be so selfish. And so God's trying to warn us. Well, what is he trying to warn us here? If you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. If you think, I'm above this, I would never do what David did. I'm a good person. I don't have any flaws if you think you are standing firm, that could be some of the most dangerous place to be because you've forgotten something. We all have a sinful nature. Every one of us is broken. There's nobody in here who doesn't struggle against sin. And if you think you're standing firm, be careful. That's a dangerous place to be. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also prov provide a way out so that you can endure it. So what's the way out? 
What's the way out so we don't fall in temptation like David did? What's the way out so our names don't wind up on the headlines like David's did? What's the way out? We need to ask this question, why did David fall? Well, obviously, one of the main reasons David falls is because he has sinful nature like any of us do. All of us have an incredible capacity for evil. Nobody's better than anybody else. But, but what were the steps that led to David's fall? One of them was power. David abused his power. David was in a place of control and he thought he could use his control to take advantage of people. And that happens all the time and it can happen to every one of us. You see in this text, it says over and over again, David sent. David sent his army out. David sent out Joab. David sent for Bathsheba. David sent for Uriah. David sent the letter. David's always sending. He's not putting himself under anybody's authority. He's using his power to take advantage of people for his own, his own desires. And we might think what we're supposed to do is to get into places of power, but that's a dangerous place to be. You know, it's kind of interesting, the founding fathers of our country. They made sure that there was checks and balances in our country because one person having all the power is not a good thing because nobody is above this temptation of taking advantage of your place of power. And so instead of seeking after power, what's the way out? What's the way out? Well, the way out of temptation is Jesus. We look at Jesus and what did Jesus do? He didn't use his power to take advantage of people. He used his power to serve. The way out is to put ourselves under Jesus, under the Lord, and ask him what he wants to do, but also to put ourselves under other authority, other spiritual authority. Put ourselves under Jesus and his church. And so as a pastor, I'm under the elders of this church. I, I answer to the elders of this church. I answer to circuit pastors and district presidents in the church body because I'm not above this. Who are you answering to? Who are you putting yourself under? This is one of the reasons it's good to be a member of a Christian church so that you put yourselves under the authority of God's word because left by ourselves, we just do a horrible job of defining what's good and evil. So don't seek absolute power. Seek putting yourself under Christ and his church. What else did David fall into? Apathy. See, David sent everybody away and he thought, you know, there's no more battles for me to fight. There's no more struggling for me to do. I can put up my feet and relax, but that's a dangerous place to be. Have you heard that phrase, um, idle hands are the devil's workshop, right? And, and so, this idea that I want to work so hard so that I can take it easy, God is not calling us to take it easy because the devil never takes it easy. Our life is one of struggle against the devil, the world, and our own sinful nature. And so the way out of apathy is Jesus. Asking Jesus, what is your will for my life? What are the new goals you have for my life? What is the meaning you have for my life? Where do you want me to struggle and fight against the devil? The way out of apathy is Jesus, is setting a new goal of realizing that life is always going to be a struggle because there's always going to be an enemy. And then the third thing that led to David's fall was isolation. David sent everybody away. He sent away Joab. He sent away all of his peers and he was left all by himself. And that's a dangerous place to be all by yourself. When you're all by yourself, you can tell yourself so many crazy things to go do and rationalize so many crazy things. And so that's why God has called us into friendships. You know, it's good to come here and worship, but this is kind of almost too big of a group. You need to continue to find peers, small groups, other Christians that you talk with and you can bounce things off of. Somebody who holds you accountable. Somebody who will look you in the face and say, don't go down that way. That's, gonna, that's leading towards destruction. The way out of this is Jesus and his people. You can't be alone. It's not good for anybody to be alone. We can, just, we can just tell ourselves all sorts of crazy things, justifying all sorts of wicked things. And so if you don't want to wind up in the headlines, 
The way out is Jesus. And, and, and let Jesus lead you away from power into submitting to his will. Let Jesus lead you out of apathy into purpose. Let Jesus lead you out of isolation into a community of believers, a friendship of other Christian people. Now, as we look at this, it looks like just another bad news story. And we've had enough bad news this last week, didn't we? When you open up the newspaper and, I don't know, my heart breaks for all the people who lost their lives in Chicago, all the people who have been shot these last few weeks, every weekend. You open up the newspaper and see the tragedy that happened in Iowa. You open up the newspaper and hear about the tragedy that happened in Pennsylvania. And there's bad news after bad news after bad news. And then you come to church and we open up and there's more bad news, right? And and it just kind of is overwhelming and we just feel hopeless and helpless and and what could we possibly do? But that's what's good about reading the Bible. Because even this tragedy ends in good news. See, what happened was God sent Nathan the prophet to David and, and he pointed out his sin and he repented of it and faced up to it and he faced the consequences of his actions and he received forgiveness in Jesus, and he was different. And what about Bathsheba? Her life that was marred by shame, the the sin that she didn't commit, Bathsheba didn't do anything wrong, she was taken advantage of. The good news is that she had a child, and that child's name was Solomon, and Solomon means peace. Bathsheba would find peace in, in the Prince of Peace, Solomon's greatest son, Jesus. Jesus, who is the King of Kings. The king over all kings. The king that was better than King David. The king who had absolute power, yet he didn't use his power to harm or destroy or take advantage of. But what did Jesus do? Jesus laid out his hands to be put on the cross. And then Jesus took in all of the evil that I've committed. All of the evil that you've committed. All of the evil that David committed. Jesus took that into himself and he paid for it. And then he came out of the grave resurrected. He came out of the grave victorious over all that is evil. But here's the best news. King Jesus is coming back again. You see, here's the problem about reading the newspaper. (laughs) You read something that's horrible, tragedy, and then the next day you read something again, then you read something again, and there never seems to be anything that's resolved. There never seems to be anything that's good. It never seems to be put back together. But that's exactly what Jesus promises to do. Jesus is coming back again. When you look at the end of the book of the Bible, it says he's coming back again. He's going to renew this world and he's going to make this world the place it was always supposed to be. He's going to give us new resurrected bodies. He's going to be the king of kings and his kingdom is going to come down to this earth. He's going to make things the way they always supposed to be. No more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. The old order of things has passed away. And now here's your job as a a Christian. As a Christian, you live in the reality, the hope of the good news. You live in the reality that things are going to get better when he returns. You live in the reality that Jesus is ruling on high and he's ruling in your heart. And so there's going to be bad news. There's going to be trials. There's going to be things that you have to go up against in this world. But there's a way out. You don't have to end up in the headlines. You don't have to go down this road. And the way out is Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Please stand.